just search my name, Reed Redden, in Texas A&M AgriLife. Uh, and there's a, a playlist for this. We had a little bit of technical difficulty with Dr. Ramsey's. Um, we're still trying to get that one pulled off and, and uploaded. But the other, the other two are up there. We should get this one as well. I think I see the recording button beeping there, John. So I think we should be good. Yes, sir. We're recording live, so we're good. Awesome, awesome. So the, the three topics were pasture, nutrition, and parasite management. And I'm just going to hit the high points. Um, you know, each of these are, are you know, hour and a half day lectures in themselves to get precise at this. And so this series on Facebook was more intended for someone that's uh, not really been in the goat business too much uh, before in their in their time. And so kind of thinking as a, a naive or a, um, a novel person coming into it. So uh, we're going to look at pastures as kind of what goats need, uh, where goats are most suited, and, and how, to, how that might fit into your operation or not. Um, nutrition, maybe when the pastures aren't supporting what they need, and then a little bit on parasite management. But again, parasitology is extremely complicated um, and takes a, a lot of um, thought process to make sure that we keep them healthy and keep the parasites out of them. So um, if you've been to any of my talks before, um, I love this graphic. I pulled it out of um, a publication, a Texas a and publication called uh, What Range Herbivores Eats and Why. And, you know, it's just a general um, a figure that basically shows kind of what sheep, goats, and cows prefer to eat. Now, they won't always eat the same percentage. It'll change throughout the year. Things are going on. But um, but for the most part, this gives you a general relative idea of what they like to eat. So goats on the far right, if I can get the little cursor here, uh, laser pointer, you know, goats over here on the right, um, they're browsers. Uh, they, they like to eat leaves of woody plants. So plants that grow up, they, they uh, select those leaves and, and pick them off. They have unique um, ability to digest those leaves especially if there's some mild toxins or things in there that cause other animals to, to not want to eat them. Uh, they will eat a certain portion of their diet in grass, especially when that grass is Im Im immature and hasn't matured out yet. And they will select forbs, um, maybe not as much as a sheep would, uh, but they do like weeds and they'll pick them out. And they're actually very good at eating little seed heads and things like that off of weeds. Um, a sheep is, is going to eat the majority of diet in grass, but uh, going to kind of have equal parts, browse, and forbs in their diet. And so if you're thinking about adding goats into your operation, if you've got a pure stand of 100% grass out there, goats could be an option, but it's not the most ideal um, situation for them. Where goats really thrive is you've got a back 40 a spot that's a little overgrown and there's some brush and there's some weeds in there and and that's where goats really fit in and we've been kind of talking about that John through these last um, couple of weeks um, we kind of even opened off the um, the four-part series talking about that and, and and those different opportunities to use goats uh, in, you know so you're not incurring cost of, of clearing brush or spraying brush or spraying weeds as you use goats to, to manage it for you you know, whereas the, the livestock species that's most common, especially in the southeastern part of uh, Texas, would be cattle, where the, you know, the dominant portion of their diet is going to be grass. And so I say this um, also to bring up that their digestive systems themselves are, are designed to digest these uh, differently. So goats are really designed to digest this browse, which tends to be um, higher quality, um, easier to digest uh, grasses or, or brow, I'm sorry, forages um, than some of our mature grasses. And so um, not only do they select this, but their digestive systems and the way the rumen mechanics is set up um, is built to, to really uh, do the best with that type of diet. So if you're in a non-traditional goat area and you don't really know what their stocking rates are, you're thinking about adding some goats, um, you know, depending on rainfall and soil type and what kind of forages you grow, um, it's very, very variable on how many goats you can run. But a good way to kind of get started is to think um, how many cows uh, can could be run on my place. And then for goats, um, 
uh, this we we generally use for a hundred pound goat is do seven goats per cow. So say um, you've got a place and you're running 25 cows, uh, but you've got some brush and you've got some weeds, you wanna add goats. If you took out five cows out of your operation um, and supplemented them with goats, you could add 35 goats back in for those five cows. Um, of course, you're gonna need a buck to generate kids. You might get two of those. Um, those are four to one. So you're really looking at probably, you know, say 30 females and maybe two males just to make sure that we cover our bases. Not that you actually need them if one is, is fertile and working, but um, that kind of gets you a relative starting point. Now that's if they were eating the same thing. But if we go back and look at that last slide, if there's not a lot of diet overlap, um, we probably don't have to do a one-to-one -one substitution. We could probably uh, do a 50% substitution or 150% substitution, I should say. Um, so, you know, if you're taking out five cows, you could probably enter back uh, seven to eight cows worth of goats. So seven times seven would be 49. So if we took out five cows, we could easily probably put back in just shy of 50 goats and not have any negative impact on the, the rangeland if our cow stocking rate was set up appropriately. All right, so um, one thing I think that's important about uh, thinking the, the nutrition and what these goats need is, especially if you're thinking of things through, from the, the eyes of a beef cattle operation, um, is to think about how their diet nutrition changes need through needs change throughout the year. Um, so uh, the goat gestation is basically five months. Um, generally, their lactation is going to last around around three months. So we've got eight months of the year, which is this line to this line when they're in production, and we have four months of the year when they're not pregnant nor lactating. Um, and that's really not true of, of beef cattle. Um, they're always lactating or gestating if they're calving on a, a one-year annual cycle generally. So um, we've, we've got four months where they're really not eating a whole lot. And, and that's what we call a maintenance period. They only need just over, or 110 pound dough would only need just over one pound per day of total digestible nutrients. So that's the portion of the feed that they eat that's digestible, which in a pasture-based situation, is generally around from 50 to 70%, depending on the quality, um, you know, if it's young and green or if it's mature or not. So they don't need a whole lot of feed during this maintenance period. And actually they don't need a whole lot of feed during the breeding period, as long as they're just gaining body condition nor do they need a whole lot of feed during early gestation. But the one thing about um, goats, and this is true of sheep as well, because they have a real narrow, if they're raising twins, that that late gestation and lactational needs really jumps up here. They need two pounds per day of total digestible nutrients, and again, if that's in the neighborhood of 50% digestible, they're going to need to eat four to five pounds of uh, quality feed to maintain their production without losing body weight. And this changes drastically. You know, you can see almost doubles the amount of feed that they need. And so when we're assessing our pasture situations and assessing feed, feeding the animals, it's highly critical that we think about the time of production that they're in because we have this big gap between what they need during four months of the year versus eight months because this early gestation and breeding period are still fairly low. And so it's important to, to think about that, you know, as I run sheep, I don't have goats, but um, you know, this is, this, this graph looks very similar with sheep, you know, and I, I really step up my game during that late gestation and lactation period. The rest of the year, um, you really don't have to be as, as strategic in your management. Uh, but you do want to think about using the rest of the year to, to get the animals into the right body condition because when their maintenance requirements are low, it's a good time to feed them just a little bit extra, let them put on weight before they get to that high demand period. As I said before, um, that's what those levels are what they need to not lose body condition. But what you can do is put body condition on them and allow them to lose some body condition if the feed resources in the pasture aren't ideal 
um, as long as they start at the optimum level and they don't lose too much weight, um, they'll remain healthy and productive. So this little graph here, again, this is a, a, a sheep graph, but the, you know, it's very applicable to goats as well. Uh, we think of things on a 12 month period, a dry period, breeding, gestation, lactation, body condition in, in sheep and goats is a one to five scale. There's some one to 10 scales, I believe, but we generally use one to five. Uh, where you know two and a half is kind of average, three is is a little better than average, and three and a half is um, even a little bit better than average. So what we generally recommend is is during the breeding period or leading up to breeding period, they should be gaining condition and gaining body weight. Um, we want to get to that body condition three um, at breeding through gestation and actually increase body condition score before they kid. And that's not just weight of the kids inside of them, but that's actually their, the amount of, um, of lean and fat that they have on their body. So we want them to be gaining weight. So I have a couple of pictures of a couple of goats here. And uh, both of these goats were in the kidding lot. So they were about to give birth. Uh, the tan goat on the left was, was a goat that said a body condition of three or slightly above. And the goat on the right is a body condition of um, about two and a half or maybe slightly below. And both, you know, if you're not really thinking about it and looking really closely, they both look in pretty good health. Um, they're both, you know, carrying pretty large fetuses inside of them. So when this doe kitted, um, she still looked in pretty good condition. She raised her kids well, did pretty good. The goat on the right over here looks pretty good now, but after she gives birth to the kids, she really gants up and gets kind of thin and she can be productive, but you're going to have to provide a lot of supplemental feed and it would have been a lot better off if we'd have turned her around and provided that supplemental feed before she get it, put that weight on her. So then she's uh, more likely to be productive and not run into health issues um, thereafter. So if those pastures aren't supporting what the goats need and keeping them in the right body condition, um, you know, we, we need to probably do some supplemental feeding. So uh, before we do that, we want to assess our, our pasture quality and quantity, what grass forbs and browsing is out there. You know, don't just let it see, you know, big, tall, belly high grass and think the goats are great. If that grass is mature and it's seeded out and there's not any weeds and there's not any browse for them, they could be losing condition and they could have really full guts on feed because they're trying to digest that low quality stuff, but it's not really ideal for them. Um, you know, we can think about that seasonal supply and where you live and how that fits with it and how that fits with your late gestation and lactational needs. Um, you know, and, and I would say, you know, in the, in the Eastern part of Texas in the winter, you still have a fair moisture. It's not super cold. There's a lot of ryegrass that grows um, in a lot of those pastures. And, you know, that's a great uh, feed for sheep and goats. They do really good on it. Um, and they do, you know, decent on some of your warm season perennials. Uh, but, but that ryegrass, until it completely seeds out and turns brown, it's still going to remain really highly quality. So you got to kind of know what forage is. Um, and the palatability of those and how that fits with sheep and goats. So if we're going to do some supplemental feeding, um, what does that need to be? Uh, very dependent upon the situation. If there's no feed out there, we're going to need some type of hay resource. Uh, picking the right hay is, is pretty important. Um, you know, the, for sheep and goats, they really like more digestible type um, hay. Of course, everything loves alfalfa. Uh, but you know, a lot of times uh, there's, there's coastal hay or grass hay available. And if that grass hay was harvested at a fairly immature um, age and it was well fertilized, it could be a really good feed resource for goats. Uh, but if it gets a little bit rank, um, they're really not going to eat it that well. And the reason they're not eating it is because their digestive system is just not able to digest it quickly enough that they're getting enough nutrients out of it. Um, hay grazer tends to be a really good feed for sheep and goats unless it gets super, super mature before it's um, cut. Um, but, you know, one great thing about it is, is the goats will tell you right away whether it's good or not. Um, they're going to go to it and really eat it or they're not. And so you, you should know very quickly how well the goats are going to do on, on this feed. 
Um, an energy source is always is always good. Goats are really good at um, at using grain to to supplement their diet. Um, you know, they're you know if you look at a goat, its its nose is really narrow and it nibbles. Um, not only can it eat browse, but it can also pick seeds, which are grains are actually seeds of plants, and do really well on it. Um, and so a little bit of grain, you know, whole corn or something like that. Um, not too much that causes acidosis can be an easy way and, and to be honest right now is the most cost effective way to add some energy to the diet uh, but we can't overfeed them on it you know it's got to be limited till their diet adjusts to it but you know generally a quarter pound is pretty safe um, and there's a lot of energy packed into that if if you're trying to get goats to eat a really low quality uh, dormant grass, I mean, that's where we think about supplementing protein to cows um, to get them to eat more grass. Doesn't work that well in sheep and goats. Um, one, they just can't digest it that well, even if you do supply enough protein. And if there's any variety at all in the pasture, um, goats will go out and identify that browse and those little bits and pieces here and there that are high in protein. And so if you're running goats and cows in the same pasture at the same time, generally the goats are always going to have a higher protein diet because they're able to select it more effectively. So just adding protein in um, may not accomplish the goal to be able to increase, you know, forage um, intake. Now, if they're in late gestation or lactation where they have a real high protein demand, you may need to supplement some protein um, so that they're able to, to grow an adequate sized fetus or they're able to lactate, uh, but it's generally not um, going to increase your forage intake. Uh, minerals and vitamins, uh, if you've got some good native natural pastures, um, generally our, our vitamins and minerals are pretty simple. Add a little salt, add a just kind of a, a run of the mill mineral packet would work. Um, there are some companies that sell uh, a goat specific mineral and, and those may be uh, what's best for you. You need to just work with your veterinarian, your nutritionist to kind of get to that. But I don't get too worked up on it unless you're running on some type of um, area where you know there's some major deficiency in mineral or if you're running on some type of farmed fields where they put down a lot of things that would be tying up minerals in that feed. Okay. Um, so once you get your nutrition program worked out, uh, the next thing is, is parasitology. You're maintaining um, low parasite loads. So the first thing that, that I always uh, encourage people to do to you know, combat parasites is the first one is to know your enemies. And so there's two major parasites that cause the most problems. There's a whole host of other ones that could pop up from time to time, but almost everybody deals with roundworms and coccidia. Um, so roundworms, uh, the, the roundworm itself that's the most damaging is Hymonchus contortus. Um, it is a blood feeder and it will actually, you know, strip the, the animal of all the blood uh, because they feed on the blood from the inside out. Um, again, we're going to hit the high points in parasitology here. I put two websites in that I think are probably the best as I go dig into material. Um, on, and they're at the bottom here. So this wormboss.com.au, of course, is that it's out of Australia. Um, and it's a fantastic um, online resource. And then here domestically, um, probably just as good is wormx.info which is a website put together by parasitologists and small ruminant specialists across the U.S. And so both of those websites are very, very good. I would be very cautious about getting your information from uh, Facebook groups because there's a lot of opinions and there's sometimes um, there's the way someone else do it may not work for you. Anyhow, so the, you know, once you understand your enemy, also kind of understanding the life cycle of that, of that worm, um, this little graph here may be difficult to see on your phones, uh, but you can find it at wormboss.com.au. It is um, a goat, basically a goat depicting the life cycle of the parasite. You know, when it goes in the animal, comes out of the animal, how long it takes, um, you know, when the animal can fight it off, so on and so forth. So that's the roundworm. Coccidia, all your goats have coccidia. Well, 
basically all you're doing is type fine mucus contortus as well. But coccidia is, is um, there all the time. It's just if the immune system has seen it before and if it's able to fight it off or not. So prevention strategies, um, you know, is, is where you should start. Uh, if your parasite management program is built on using a dewormer and parasites show up and you don't really think about it other than just drenching them when they have worms, um, the parasites will win in the long run um, unless, you know, you just have a really low stocking rate somewhere because they are quickly evolving and adapting to develop resistance to dewormers. So if you're constantly overgrazing and underfeeding, um, and, and not selecting animals that are able to fight off parasites themselves, um, you're going to continue to struggle with parasites. And so it's important that those animals are in a good body condition score during the time that they're most susceptible, and that is during late gestation and lactation. You know, when their nutritional demands are the highest, their immune system is also the most compromised at that time. And it's it's, uh, or I guess goats are three times more likely to deal with internal parasites and have like a triple or three times as higher parasite load if they're under a body condition score three versus over a body condition score three um, through that lactation period. So it's very important that, that they have proper nutrition so that they can fuel the immune system to try and fight it off. Unfortunately, goats are browsers, as we talked about before, and they are not designed to fight off internal parasites like, say, maybe a sheep or a cow is that are more grazers. So they don't have the just natural inherent ability to fight off parasites. They do have some, but not to the degree that um, some sheep or, or cattle do. And so it's, imp it's really important that we don't... Um, you know, breed and select animals that are very sensitive uh, to to do um, to internal parasites, and we're constantly needing dewormers to to fix the problem. Uh, the other thing about prevention is pasture contamination. So, how do we eliminate or, or reduce the contamination that's in the pasture, or the contamination that's in the pasture that they're grazing in by pasture rotation, um, which can be challenging because this parasite lives for months if not years in the pasture if the conditions are right. Um, there is some products of bioworma that you can feed to the animals that actually reduce the pasture contamination but it may be a bit cost prohibitive for, for some folks. Um, you know but the main thing is, is is thinking about that pasture contamination and thinking about making sure that we leave some refugia of parasites that have not gone treated. And again I'm hitting the high points. If this is the first time you've heard a parasite talk, just recognize that it's complicated. And if you're really serious about raising goats and in, in, in any type of large scale or larger scale, that you really need to focus on learning about parasites. Oh, uh, the third strategy in, in, in managing parasites is having the right treatment plan. So it first starts with who are the animals that I'm going to treat. Um, ideally, if you're in an area where you can handle the animals routinely, is to use the FAMACHA scoring system. Um, there's a number of videos on this. Um, I've produced some and there's a number of others across the US and across the world on quantifying anemia and only treating animals that are anemic. Since um, Hymachus is a blood feeder, you can actually see anemia in the eyelids. So ideally, if you can just uh, monitor those that need to be treated, only treat those um, and not treat everybody so that you do allow some parasites to live in those that don't need treatment and it keeps um, um, a susceptible population of parasites out in the pastures and in your animals. And then what you're gonna treat them with. Um, I think it's very important that when you provide a dewormer that we're not just going and grabbing something off the shelf um, and kind of, just just going based off the back of the bottle because uh, there's a lot of resistance out there. Not all the products work very well or work effectively anymore. We generally recommend using uh, at least two active ingredients at one time, if not three, especially if you're spot treating animals. Um, and then also potentially looking at copper oxide wire particle boluses as another treatment strategy or supplement to a treatment strategy. So we want to try and get a 99% effective kill rate, which in, would also include using the proper dose. And all this information you can find at wormx.info. So 
with that uh, kind of concludes our, our um, basic discussion here today. I would say, you know, that we've done a lot of work putting together some YouTube videos on all of these topics. And so if some of this that I've talked about is interesting, but you want to keep digging, um, I encourage you to go to our YouTube channel. If you search my name, Reed Redden, Texas A&M AgriLife. Um, I have a channel there, uh, the two videos on the left, the one on, on best management practices for dewormers is up there, as is using copper oxide wire particle boluses to help improve our parasite control. Um, both of those have thousands of views um, and people really got, get a lot of good info from it. Um, I've also got some videos that I worked with some people in College Station and they're on Ranch TV, which is, is generally more driven towards beef cattle, but we've got sheep and goat section there. And so, you know, this one is about kind of understanding and seeing the uh, signs and symptoms of parasitism. So I encourage you to go to those channels and subscribe to them. If you've got any follow-up questions to them, feel free to reach out to me and I do the best, do everything I can to help you uh, kind of answer some of those questions. With that, um, we're going to kind of wrap it up this morning. John, I don't know what I'm at on time, but I suppose I'm probably 20 to 30 minutes in here. It looks like we've got 45 people still on and some questions coming in. Um, John, yes. do you have some questions? Yes, sir. Uh, one question from Ms. Chisholm is, do you know where we can buy good hay grazing? Oh, where is Ms. Chisholm from? And she's from, looks like she's from Huntsville area. Huntsville, okay. I don't have any direct contacts there, Ms. Chisholm, but I would encourage you to get in touch with your local county agent and uh, they probably know somebody who puts up hay grazer hay. Absolutely. Looks like that's the only real question we have. Um, we do have a good following. We have uh, our friend from Columbia has joined us once again. And uh, they've been a pretty constant uh, uh, participant in our programs week after week. So that's pretty cool to have. And again, we have a good representat representation from all over Texas. Um, from area all the way up to big old Seymour, Texas. So we've got a, a pretty good following. So uh, uh, with that, does anybody have one one last round of questions we can ask Dr. Redden before we uh, call it the day? And I hope we're calling it the day. This is well. This call is... it the day for this, then 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 get started on uh, the fun stuff. Well, Dr. Edden, it looks like that's all we have today. Um, be sure to, to send us some feedback. Uh, let us know what you guys think. And uh, we'll kind of wrap these sessions up. I have one question that did come in, Dr. Edden. Is there a certain species of goat that is more resistant? I think with the... Uh... With well, a question, is there a certain breed of goat um, that, is, that is more resistant? Yes. So, uh, the Spanish, there is a little bit of data on this, and it tends to be that um, the Spanish goat um, is likely the most resistant to parasites. Uh, the Kiko um, is also somewhat comparable. In that in that realm, and, and both of those are kind of land race goats. So the Spanish is land race. It's kind of just survived survival of the fittest here in Texas for hundreds of years. Uh, the Kikos out of New Zealand, it's kind of the same thing. The boar goat, because it's been selected, you know, for increased size and muscling and growth rate, uh, tends to be the most susceptible to internal parasites. A lot of folks kind of like the picture on the screen. Uh, a boar Spanish cross tends to be a good commercial type goat um, or if you want to run kind of straight Spanish um, that's also an option or straight Kiko but again that's that's general terms there's always variability there's more variation within a breed than a cross breed so if you've got a breed that you like um, you can probably find the animals that have some level of parasite resistance that may either meets your needs or something that you can select for into the future. Just depends on where you kind of want to start at. Got a uh, 
Got a two-part question for you. Can you discuss pastor, or actually it's about a three-part question. Can you discuss pastor rotation, its importance and effectiveness in management of parasites? And then the second part is what is, what is the time guidance for the rest of the pasture, not for grass growth, but parasite management? Okay. So um, that life cycle chart, if you go back and look at that, the, it kind of talks about the, the life cycle uh, or the amount of time that it can live. So one of the things that you don't want to do is commonly people talk about a 21 day, um, commonly people talk about a 21 day life cycle, right? So uh, a three week life cycle, which is true, um, but it's not, it's not precise to that. So once the eggs are deposited in, in, in the feasties and it comes out, it takes between um, four and 10 days for that egg to hatch and that larva to get out on the grass. Once that larva is on the grass, it's infective so they could eat it, consume it, and then it takes um, about two and a half weeks or so before it becomes mature and starts feeding eggs. So that's the 21 day life cycle. But the problem is, is that larva in warm, wet conditions can survive up to six months. So, and it can go from the egg to the um, infected larva in four days. So unless you can rotate every three days and not come back to the same pasture for six months, you can't effectively rotate your way out of it. But not to say that rotation doesn't help because if you just have a single pasture, they're gonna constantly regraze um, areas. And so areas that they graze, they defecate. Uh, when it rains, it regrows. That's the most palatable grass. And so they go back to it. So rotation helps, but you can't use that to completely stop um, parasite you know, infection load. And so I think that hopefully that kind of addresses the question. If not, they can put a follow-up comment in there. Um, no, I think that covers it pretty good. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, the mob grazing approach where, you know, if you're using electric fence and, you know, moving them every three days, um, you know, it's, it, it's going to really help with your parasites, um, you know, but there's, it's labor intensive and the goats may not knock down and eat that forage as well as say a cow or, or a sheep would. You know, the other thing is, is if you're running cows, um, so sheep and goats share hymoncus, the same hymoncus, and so um, they don't complement each other. It's actually vice versa. They, they complicate the problem more. But if you're running cows and goats, and so you're pasture rotating to where you move goats out of a pasture and you move cows into it, when those eggs hatch and develop and the cows eat them, that stops the life cycle uh, because they don't live in both species. So um, probably rotation with multiple species is um, more effective than rotation with a single species. Perfect. Another question we have, is there any research on genetic markers for worm resistance? So, um, not to my knowledge. Uh, there's been a lot of this research in goats or in sheep, um, and there probably has been some done in goats. I haven't seen it though. I can research that up and post it in the comments if I find it. Uh, but the problem with a lot of this genetic markers is they're very specific to the pool of genetics that they're selected from. Um, that these markers aren't that simple. They're very divergent across different uh, breeds of goats in different countries. And so likely if that research has been done, it's probably been done in another country. And rarely does those markers uh, correlate to goats in different breeds and in different parts of the world. So if there is done, some done, it's probably not conclusive enough that we can use. There is research um, or uh, technology that's available for goat breeders to use um, estimated breeding values. So um, we do this with sheep and we're, we're looking at developing a goat herd to do this as well. But essentially you take a, a fecal sample from every kid that is um, born or not, I mean, every kid 
at around 120 days of age or so when they have a natural parasite challenge, you send it to a lab. Uh, we actually do provide the fecal testing services in San Angelo and they analyze it uh, to quantify what their parasite load is. And then um, they track it across the genetic lines and give you a genetic predictor for parasite resistance. And so there's a couple of those goat breeders on, um, they actually use the National Sheep Improvement Program as a platform to, to get this done. Uh, and the uh, Kentucky State University is probably the leaders in this. And they've been breeding a, a boar, Spanish or straight boar herd of goats for uh, 10 plus years, maybe even 20 years for this. And they've made a lot of progress in uh, improving the breeding values for parasite resistance. Awesome. We had a follow-up question kind of to that earlier one. And, it's, and she asked, uh, can the concept of mob grazing be effective? Uh, high intensity grazing. Um, it can, the, the one concern, it, to me, it depends on the forage type and, and how quickly we can get to it. So, uh, mob grazing in, a if we're grazing like winter cereals, wheat, oats, triticale, ryegrass, um, those type of grasses that are in the cooler part of the year, um, as long as they're still you know, green, that you, you that that feed is very palatable. They're gonna eat a lot of it. Probably the same thing with like hay grazer. Um, that, that's gonna work very well. The, the downside probably to goats in doing this in a warm season perennial grass type system is if you start getting really tall, mature, rank grass, um, the goats aren't going to thrive on that just because that's not the type of forage that they really like to eat. Um, you could probably get by with nannies that are in maintenance. They might be able to maintain themselves, but if they're trying to lactate and you have young kids that are trying to grow and you're forcing them to eat older, ranker grass. Now, if you can keep your high intensity rotations going fast enough to stay ahead of the grass where it's still in the, you know, early growth phase, um, it would probably work, but that would be my concern is if you're um, a, a lower palatable type of grass and you're trying to force them to eat it at a more mature size. Awesome. Um, just kind of had another question and, and basically um, asking, is there a lab in San Angelo? And uh, uh, they're just wanting some info on the lab itself. Sure. If you go to sanangelo.tamu.edu, um, that's our homepage. Again, sanangelo.tamu.edu. And then um, there is a lab testing services there. Uh, it's a, a tab. And you select that tab, and on that tab, it'll have fecal egg count testing. And that's our website, and it has all the information on it. And we've got a YouTube video on kind of how, how to collect samples and when to send them in and things. Now, to be clear, this is not a diagnostic lab. You should still work with your veterinarian to quantify if you have a parasite problem to drench with. This lab is for, you know, whole herd testing for genetic selection. Um, you know, diagnostic labs, are, their costs for tests are, are um, generally in the, the 15 to $25 range and we're doing tests for $5. You know, the only way we can do that is in large volume. And again, we're not providing uh, veterinarian diagnostic services, just genetic testing services. Awesome. So I think that's gonna wrap us up for this week, Reed. Um, again, uh, thank everybody for, uh, for joining us across the country and, and, and actually a couple of internationals that we have. I want to encourage you, each and every one of you to uh, be sure to, to reach out to your local county extension agent if you have any questions. They're a, uh, a great resource and they are a gateway to specialists like Reed that we can, uh, we work with these guys on a regular basis and uh, uh, it keeps everybody in the loop and, and it really helps with your local area too that uh, uh, Reed's got a wealth of knowledge and, and, and the other specialists do as well. Uh, but your county extension agent also knows your area that you're that you're living in, 
So be sure to reach out to those guys. Reed has a lot of great resources on here as well. It is Facebook and the uh, Ranch TV. I did have a question if, if this was being recorded, and yes, it is. Uh, you can follow it back on uh, this web page or this uh, Facebook page at any time. You can see it also, too. Uh, Reed has his uh, YouTube uh, page that it's posted. It'll be posted on there uh, later today as well. So you can feel free to, 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 to follow us on either, either page, and uh, you can always find this resource. So all the uh, recordings that we've done so far uh, have been posted, except for uh, the one with Dr. Ramsey, which you can find on this uh, our uh, Brazos Valley uh, Small Ruminant page uh, that you're on. Uh, but we are working on getting that recording pulled pulled as well. So uh, with that, uh, Reed, do you have any follow up? I don't. I I just appreciate everybody's attention and coming in and, and listening in. If they've ever got questions, like you said, get in touch with the county agent. We'd love to work with you. Awesome. Well, with that, everybody have a great day. And uh, please, please, please send us some follow-up. Uh, you can send it to me at john.grange at ag.tamu.edu. Uh, if you have any follow-up questions, any ideas for future programs, please send that to me or send it or contact Reed and let Reed know. Um, his contacts have been posted all throughout here as well. Uh, let either of us know so we can uh, we can uh, try to tailor make their uh, fit some programming for your needs or, or, or answer some questions. So with that, I'm going to call up the day. Everybody have a great, wonderful day. Stay safe out there. Be sure to wash your hands and follow your guidelines, and let's keep us all safe. Thanks, John. Have a good one. You too, Mike.